Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Keo Kim. I'm from the Department of Environmental Science, and uh, I'm here to welcome you to our afternoon session on the amazing places where research takes place. Uh, before we begin, I want to give you a uh, lay of the land of the things that we're going to be doing. Uh, in addition to sort of gloating over the places that we work, uh, I wanted to do something a little more productive. And the one is to see if there's any uh, potential for collaboration amongst faculty who work on field-based uh, research to, to come together and, and share field sites and places and expertise and knowledge. And then finally, to also uh, talk about how to engage our students in research and use our excellent and exotic field sites to attract students to, to our university uh, and, and get our students involved in research because uh, those opportunities uh, serve the students very well. They, they go on to do lots of other great things using research opportunities as a platform for graduate school and scholarships and fellowships and the like. And so uh, for the first third of this session, Chap is going to talk about his research in Kenya and then I'll talk very briefly about some of the work that I'm doing in the aquatic realm and then we'll talk about some of the other things, opportunities and collaborations on campus. Okay. So with that, Chap. Thanks, Gil. Um, I, I just, I, I got here, I was in Kenya for Christmas and just came in last night. So uh, I, I very quickly put this together. Um, it's my first time here and so I'm really, really excited to be, to be here. Um, I spent the last 20 years uh, in Chicago at the Field Museum, where I also taught at the University of Illinois at Chicago. But what really attracted me to AU is, uh, particularly the anthropology department, is uh, its commitment uh, to social change and to addressing issues that we confront us today, including some of the ones that are enum enumerated here. And so when I started looking for a change and I saw this position, uh, it was very, it was too hard to pass. But I'm really excited uh, to be here. I'm uh, excited at the holistic nature of uh, anthropology that is practiced here, uh, its integrative and interdisciplinary perspective, uh, but especially its commitment to, to social change and, and justice. But as an archaeologist, uh, often I think my, uh, I'm much more um, interested, at least intellectually, in looking at the past as, as a way of understanding where we are going. Uh, I work in a region in the world that is, for which we know very little about. But in fact, if you look at this um, statement out here, you will find that for the larger part of our history, most people have lived and in fact died in, in, in Africa uh, until at least uh, 100 years, 100,000 years ago. That was the only place that people in fact existed. And so I think as an archaeologist and a historian, I think the past is indispensable. Uh, today I think uh, it's very hard to say, but for this six plus billion peoples, uh, it is very clear that we only represent 7% uh, of all the human beings who have, who have lived. That is to say, out of every um, uh, 14 people who have lived, out of every one person today, uh, 13 of those have in fact uh, lived and died. Uh, so as you look at pre present day's problems, we can only ignore the past at our own peril. In most cases, when you think about Africa, you sort of look at the more recent past, uh, where that shaped, in fact, Africa's relationship with the, with the West. This is really a time when Africa goes through a process of devolution. Uh, and, uh, but, and, and that's what has really captivated our imagination about, about Africa, and in fact, our, our, our perceptions about Africa and sometimes even uh, peoples of African descent. This is a challenge that we still need to, but as academics, I think Africa is one of those really, really exciting places to, uh, to study, precisely because you can't be an Africanist without being uh, an interdisciplinary person. 
doesn't matter whether you are studying mathematics or engineering, but in fact you have to, to use the interdisciplinary perspective. And so as a university professor and a student, Africa is one of the best laboratories to, uh, to work. In my own research, I employ all of these um, methodologies for, in fact, understanding the African past. And so I have no, I can only use an interdisciplinary perspective in whatever field, in, in whatever area that, that I study. And I've used all of this. I'm no expert in any of those. But suddenly I think I employ all the, the, these uh, methodologies to unearth and understand um, Africa and by extension uh, the peoples of, of Africa, us. My research interests are very broad. I'm interested in the issues of the rise of urbanism in Eastern Africa. I study trading systems and networks in the Indian Ocean. I'm interested in issues of governance and leadership. I also study inequality and resistance. But I'm also interested in studying the uh, biological genealogies of the peoples of, of Africa. Africans are the most mixed peoples anywhere in the world. And so I think understanding how uh, they have interacted with each other helps us, in fact, understand some of the present problems, such as tribalism uh, and ethnicity that uh, bedevil Africa uh, today. I have active ongoing programs in uh, four countries. Uh, Kenya, the country where I grew up, I was originally born in Uganda, but we moved to Kenya when I was in five years. I work in Madagascar and in India and, and China. And all these are essentially very active projects which I, I hope in future will in <coughs> begin to involve uh, several of our students, both undergraduates and, and graduate students. Uh, these are some of the images of places that I work. Uh, this is a major urban center in uh, Kenya. It's called Gede. It dates from about 800 to 1500. Uh, this is an even earlier settlement dating from around 600 to 1430s. Uh, and this is a, a small a colonial outpost in central Madagascar. And this is a small village in central Madagascar that I've been doing. Uh, some research looking at the evolution of rice and cattle pasture pasture. My research, uh, because of its interdisciplinary nature, has always involved, in fact, talking and to the elders, to the people in places where we, we work. And interestingly, uh, as I've been doing, ethno, collecting ethno, ethno histories and life histories of, of these folks, I've also been able to walk around and look at the archaeological formation processes. Some of these abandoned homes eventually become archaeological sites that we, we, essentially, we essentially study. And so this has been just the nature of my work. And uh, we've been doing this since 1989 and now have nearly 800 hours, recorded uh, hours on, on video. Uh, that uh, we can very quickly turn into documentaries, uh, but we can also uh, transcribe and, uh, and continue to. So I've gone to the same, same people over and over, and so as the story changes with age, you can study a lot of mentions, including memory itself, and how their perspectives also change. Uh, these are some of the places that uh, we have been uh, working. This is uh, the Mount Elgon area of Western Kenya, where we've been looking at the uh, evolution of agriculture and agricultural systems. And this area is actually extremely, extremely uh, beautiful. Uh, it's like these 10 months of the year. It has high rainfall regimes, extremely rich. Um, I've been working on issues of uh, local technologies with. Uh, 
uh, local pottery women. And I think that pottery technologies are very, very important because archaeologically, 80% of what is left are things like this. And archaeologists have written a lot about pottery typology as a way of identifying groups. But ironically, whenever you talk to uh, these uh, potters and you ask them the meanings of these symbols, they are totally meaningless. Most of them are just for aesthetic reasons but have absolutely no meaning uh, to it. So we make things up. In Madagascar, we've been working with, um, we've been working with uh, uh, weaving, local weaving uh, weavers in the central, central highlands. Um, and in Madagascar, at the same time, of looking at the evolution of funding systems, the relationship between rice, agriculture, and in fact, pastoralism. Um, because of the very thin soils in the central highlands and high erosion, uh, what has really happened over the years is that rice has become so dependent on, on, on pastoralism. So that what they have done is evolved a system whereby the corrals were down essentially so valuable that in fact cattle uh, is the essence of the way of life of the central Malagash uh, peoples, particularly the Sileo and, and the Marina. And so one of the things that I'm doing is looking at the relationship between this and that, but also look at what happens when up and up when when cities evolve, because this is a very very labor intensive uh, way of maintaining the land. Yes. Oh, is that wall at the top part of a water uh, control? Well, this wall here is actually a corral. Um, uh, it's actually dug underground, and then when the cattle come, they're essentially put here, and so all of the dung is actually collected here, and uh, then. Uh, process and harvest it. So what's going on here is that these people are removing the dung and carrying it to the farms. So the question is when, in the absence of cows, what happens? Because these are really some of the world's poorest folks. Um, and so when I was working, I've been working here for the last 12 years, when I was working there, uh, there was cattle rustling. And so, uh, people experienced a huge drop in the output of rice, and certainly importing rice from Thailand. And I was conflicted as a, an anthropologist, because I was there studying, but also witnessing all of these changes. And so I asked them, have you ever arrested some of these cattle thieves? They said, we do, we take them to the police, and then they bribe the police mm -hmm. and uh, they go out, they, they, they get off so easily. I said, have you tried to kill some of them? Mm -hmm. They said, no, we have not tried to do that. I said, why don't you do that? So I found myself, in fact, becoming this agent of change. I was supposed, supposed to interfere. And in fact, this is what happened. This is what happened. And when you go back to the villages, you know, the village now is thriving because they know that if you go to that village to steal cows, you won't come out alive. Right. But so, that's just one of the other things. One of the things that I've been doing too is East Africa is an interesting place because it's so close to the Middle East. A lot of the residents of the East Coast of Africa uh, have very multiple ancestry. Their ancestors came from uh, Persia, from South Asia, and all these places. So very, very mixed groups, like being in Sicily, or being in London, in a lot of ways, or being some of the early cities in Central America, like Titicaca, where you have very mixed populations. So one of the, one of the projects we've been trying to do is uh, try to understand where the biological um, genealogies of the, the coastal people another area of, in fact, uh, collaboration in biogenetics um, uh, and, uh, and, and archaeology and history all, all, all working, working together. So in essence, what we've done is we've collected the life histories of 
many of my informants, they're telling us where they think they, their ancestors came from, but we're also then collecting saliva and then testing that upon what their, essentially, their perceptions are. Archaeologically, we've been able to uh, do a lot of surveys in the hinterland and in areas where we have been able to work, we are able to find very vibrant uh, villages and children communities that are developing at least beginning from the last 10,000 years all the way to the, uh, to the present. And along the coast, you see the emerges of, of, of towns and, and, and the central port towns beginning from at least 3,000 years ago. So you have this kind of connections that are, that are going on. Uh, this, the model that we have developed to, to explain how rural and urban peoples were, uh, were related is essentially looking at systems of, uh, systems of knowledge that people have spread. And uh, since the, in the interior you have subversaries, agropassaries, hunters, and, 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 and urbanists who are all working together. We begin to look at the system of and how trade developed within this thing. If you, when it comes to looking at connections, East Africa where I work is very much connected by language and culture, Islam, by geography, by religion, by trade, and by travel to this part of the world. So in many cases, the area that I've been working is really like that. So you can't really look at East Africa in isolation. You have to look at the coast, its hinterland, and then the price uh, national perspective. So an elite community, an elite family, an elite the wealth or the wealthy elite of East Africa, around 1400, lived in homes like those. These are homes that you actually don't see when you come to uh, the 18th century because from around the 1600s not a single house, permanent house like this was built all over the entire uh, African, uh, the entire Africa. You might actually say that yes there were, but these are essentially European fortresses that began to surround Africa, but before that you had uh, these places. And these are places that are, we, we study that could really be enlightening to uh, shaking down some of the perspectives and the prejudices we have about African students are probably the best agents of this. Presently we are working at this uh, small um, town, it's called Manda, it's actually the oldest port town in uh, East Africa. Interestingly, the town was actually divided into two separated by a wall, and what we are doing is trying to determine why this wall, why these foreign people and these locals, right? but this, this author are, are these just two different neighborhoods that are separated by wealth, wealth differences or by ethnicity. The town looks most like that, this is where it is standing, uh, this is the oldest mosque in uh, East Africa. Uh, some of the structures. Uh, last year we carried out some excavations and recovered you know, some individuals as well as other artifacts. There's some of the trenches we excavated. And as we're beginning to think about work in some of these uh, towns, we are we can't help separating some of this by gender and by age. Um, and this is also informed by some of our own ethnographic uh, assumptions and observations that we find in modern day East Africa. This is some of the uh, artifacts that we are finding uh, that show essentially some of the cottage industries that were being carried out there. These are bead grinders for making beads. Um, this is for weaving. Uh, they're making both, uh, they're importing some beads, but they're also making some for marine and also eggshells. 
but they are also uh, processing rock crystal, which they are exporting to Asia and even to, to North Africa. They are also they have their own forms of currency. Uh, ivory was in fact a form of currency. You have this young coin which we found when we were there, and then of course quarry shells. Uh, we believe that this young coin may have been brought to East Africa by Admiral Jeha when he visited uh, East Africa around the 14, 1425. Uh, so we, we, we're beginning to separate some of these in terms of just scares, uh, some of the work that is going on. But you're also interested in issues of gender. In fact, one of the most important things that could be very, very useful for students here is essentially looking at some of the relationship between local women uh, and, in fact, uh, traders. We know that in the past, as today, traders often are rarely accompanied by their wives. And, of course, these liaisons do exist. In fact, the development of diasporic communities worldwide might be, in fact, linked to understanding some of this uh, relationship that might have existed. Uh, looking at connections between Af East Africa and South Asia, I've essentially been looking at two contemporary sites, one in East Africa and another one in, in, in Chamul, Maharashtra. And as we move forward, one of the things, one of the programs that we are going to develop here is essentially to have summer programs in two places that will run sort of alternate. So one year students will be in East Africa and then the other summer they will be in, uh, in India to sort of rotate. The same students going to both places, both graduate and undergraduate. I think, I think in this way they will be able to really understand what is really going on and understand issues of early globalism and what this might actually mean. Sites in India are four or five times larger than what we have, what we have in East Africa. In fact, this is a site that um, I was visiting two months ago, and this is essentially where we are going to be, to be working. It's a 500 hectare uh, site. It was the, Chaul was the largest port uh, the second largest port when the Portuguese were, were there. It's now, the site is now in a devil farm, but it's still, in fact, quite available for, for us. And the connection that one can see between this site and East Africa is the presence of baobab trees. They're essentially African uh, domesticates. The sites there, the, the edge of Chamur is extremely old because it goes back to 200 BC, um, so essentially, Chaul interacted with the people of Chaul interacted with uh, with Romans during that time. So, the 200 BC to 1750, uh, Manda is 600 AD, uh, 1750. It's a comparative. Some of the other work that I don't want to talk about because of time is the work that we are uh, collaborating with my colleague, Dr. Chu. Uh, from Sunny at Sen, and essentially what we are looking at is trying to find out some of the trade settlements that we find in East Africa, and sort of putting them in some of the, um, uh, the specific kiln sites and mapping them to specific kiln sites in China, as well as a way of understanding the nature of of, of trade within China itself and and uh, of course the rest of the rest of the world. Um, uh, this is uh, some of the, the kilos. These are massive industrial complexes. Uh, this, uh, for example, for this uh, town era site from here to here is nearly 200 meters. So they're really, really uh, massive. Uh, this leads to uh, 750 uh, through uh, 1300. Uh, the just a massive uh, debris that one gets. 
um, a lot of the uh, this uh, porcelain we also find in uh, in all East African sites and I think one of the things that we are thinking about doing and students to really get involved here is essentially looking at the ongoing practices between traditional potters, for example, in Western Kenya, and in fact traditional potters in even towns like Fujian in China. And I think some of these traditional potters in China are now only actors. They are doing it for tourists. So this guy, for example, makes his pot, and then the tourists take their pictures and then collapses it ways to think that they do but but it's really really interesting to to do that as we look at what is really changing i've been extremely fortunate uh, in securing uh, a lot of funding for for my own research and i'm hoping that this is something that we can continue to do here uh, in the coming years thank you very much So I think um, uh, we need to transition technology. So if you have questions for chat, we can do that while I plug in or to chat about yeah. this stuff. Yeah. I, I've often marveled and wondered at how archaeologists choose to cite the trenches. In other words, you have this enormous map of Manda and some very, very localized trenching. Um, how do you know that you want to dig here and here and here? But see, we, we, uh, in the past, um, our predecessors didn't have uh, the advantage of technology. But presently, what we do is we do geophysical mapping of the of the sites, and so we did magnetometer as well as we use a grand penetrating radar, run it over, map the entire site so that we exactly know places with high magnetic content that we then go and, and try to excavate. It's more like, uh, today, archaeology has become more like fishing. Mm -hmm. So you see a school of fish, and then you, you drop your yeah. line. It's become more like that. And so the early stages of, of preparing the site are very labor intensive, because you still have to map the whole, the whole site. And so when you are now excavated because excavation becomes a very ex ex it's a very expensive um, undertaking. You just don't want to shoot and and, and miss. You want to go exactly where where you are. So technology has such really really advances in technology have been extremely useful for for us. There is some lack to you know. <laughs> All right, so <coughs> I'm going to switch uh, environments all together. So I'm going to talk about some of the work that I've been doing underwater. I'm a marine ecologist by training, and a lot of what my interests uh, lie, I focus on is how coral reefs are constructed. That is from an ecological perspective. How do coral reefs assemble themselves, and what are some of the forces that result in their destruction? And, and the premise is that if you can understand what's causing their decline, you can then address the issues that could slow the, the process down and perhaps even uh, mitigate the decline of the reef altogether. Um, when I finished up my PhD, uh, where I did a lot of my work in um, the Florida Keys and also Panama, uh, one of the emerging issues for marine ecologists was the role of diseases. This is a picture from, from the Florida Keys, and this is a, a NOAA boat that we did a lot of research off of. Um, it wasn't always this, this calm. It was almost like a lake. Most of the time, you were in three, four foot swells, and you were being tossed around. You had tanks strapped to your back and stuff like that. You were, I literally got sick underwater. I actually thrown up underwater. I was being swished back and forth so often. Uh, but um, the, the, the work is, um, when I was finishing up my uh, dissertation work, there was an emerging question that is, was uh, based on the idea of diseases and whether or not there were important ecological forces underwater for a very long time. Uh, you know. People thought that the marine environment was really protected and isolated from diseases that affect terrestrial organisms. And, and that was probably mostly out of ignorance more than anything else. And also because if you think about it, scuba diving was only about 30, 40 years old. And so people hadn't been looking extensively underwater until fairly recently versus what terrestrial ecologists have been doing for millennia. Um, there were a couple of things that were happening began, beginning in the late 80s that started to, to ring the bells for marine ecologists. One was the die-off of this very dominant coral in the Caribbean. 
these corals were everywhere in very shallow water, and within a span of a couple of years, they simply died out from the Caribbean altogether. And it was sort of like the Dutch elm disease in the marine environment. You had all these millions of uh, Dutch elm trees. In a span of four or five years, they were completely gone, billions of them. So that happened. Not too uh, long after that, another disease broke out, and it began at the, uh, the Caribbean terminus of the uh, Panama Canal. Uh, one of the scientists noticed the die out of a sea urchin. These are very important. You probably had some if you have ever had sushi. They, the sea urchin rows are very important uh, uh, source of food, and when you make when you make sushi and things like that. But they're also important ecologically because they're like the gazelles of the ocean environment. They go around grazing grasses and, and algae, and in essence keeping the marine environment relatively clean and devoid of these algae that can run amok if you let them. And so um, starting around 1980, uh, scientists at the Smithsonian noticed that these things were dying out, and within a single year, the disease sort of spanned the entire Caribbean basin. And by the end of it, it only took a year, uh, more than 95% of these sea urchins disappeared. And again, we're talking about hundreds of millions of these organisms dying out in a single year. And so these large, very large disease outbreaks uh, began to focus the attention of marine ecologists on the role of diseases. During that time, another disease outbreak was happening. It was an outbreak that was affecting sea fans. And these are the sea fans <coughs> that are very common to the Caribbean. So they're about eight tall, and about they're flat, and that's why they're called sea fans. And uh, they're a very important part of the, the Caribbean reef now because many of the other corals have been dying out. Uh, when I was finishing up my dissertation, there was a uh, disease that, were, that was affecting these corals and they were causing these, these things to die within a single year. And it began in, uh, in an island off the coast of South America. And again, it did this ring around the Caribbean, starting off in, in South America, off the coast of South America. And Florida Keys was the last place to be hit. And so you can just sort of track this going across the Caribbean Basin along with the loop current that is a dominant current in the Caribbean Basin. And so uh, we spent a lot of time on the water trying to track the outbreak of this disease. Uh, part of the work took us to the Bahamas, uh, San Salvador in particular. This is the no corals here. This is just the stingray. Mm -hmm. Might give you something else to focus on. Uh, San Salvador was very interesting because San Salvador is in essence a uh, vestige of these organisms that secreted the calcium carbonate out of the bottoms of the ocean. And this is a column of biogenic calcium carbonate that breaks to the surface. And the island of San Salvador, which is part of the Bahamian Islands, sort of sticks on top of that. And so if you swim maybe 40, 50 yards from the shore to the edge of this thing, you're looking down at maybe 3,000 uh, meters of water. And so you could be in 15 feet of water, and all of a sudden you look over, there's about two kilometers of water. It's a very spectacular place. You can dive on the edge of the, of, of the wall, and sometimes you get disoriented, and a lot of people don't come back because they get sort of narked, and, and they keep swimming down when they should be coming up. Uh, the Bahamas is sort of interesting because it was isolated. We thought that these, these diseases were, were happening in places where there's lots of tourism and, and people and all the other things that were happening to the coastal environment was acting synergistically with these diseases. And so the fact that the, the island of San Salvador, which is the most isolated of the Bahamian Islands, was being affected by this spectacularly. Uh, in fact, one group of these sea fans were completely decimated by the end of this process. It was sort of a, a, a interesting news. A lot of people had different ideas about why this was happening. Climate change is obviously one of the biggest drivers, and, and, and temperature change in particular. And so people looked at temperature data to figure out whether or not it was temperature driving this disease outbreak, maybe more so than, say, pollution coming from development. And none of the data showed that to be the case. The data that we have from the Florida Keys, uh, we monitor these sea fans for 10, 10 years, and there's no sort of temperature signal in why these diseases are affecting the corals as they are. And we also know, for example, uh, there are places way in the middle of the Pacific uh, that get really warm, but they don't die out from diseases. And so it wasn't temperature per se. And so one of the, the hypotheses that, that our group is uh, uh, positing was the role of nitrogen pollution. Now, you're saying, well, how about the Bahamas? Bahamas is sort of anomalous in that regard because it's in the middle of nowhere. But if you think about the Caribbean basin and the atmosphere on top of the Caribbean basin, it's, it's, it's um, ringed by lots and lots of people. And nitrogen pollution enters the ocean primarily through rivers. 
but also <coughs> through atmospheric deposition. So if you burn a lot of fossil fuel to make electricity, which is what we do, so, you know, most of our electricity comes from burning of coal, or running cars or any other industries that burn fossil fuels, all of that nitrogen gets volatilized, goes into the atmosphere, and then deposits back into the ocean. Not only that, there's another interesting thing about the Bahamas uh, connecting with Africa. There are constant windstorms that bring nutrients and other particles from uh, the Sierra Desert across the Atlantic Ocean and deposits them onto the Caribbean. Uh, many parts of the Bahamian Islands are covered with uh, fine clay sands that originated from West Africa, not from the local area. And so we know that there are lots of other things that were happening to make the story of Bahamas very, very complicated. And so uh, recently, about six years ago, um, I reached out to a colleague of mine who I overlapped with when I was at Cornell as a postdoc, who is now a faculty at the University of Guam. And Guam is sort of interesting because it's in the middle of nowhere. Literally, it's in the middle of nowhere. It takes about 22 hours of travel to get there. And the population size isn't all that big. There's about 170,000 people. And so we got, we've gotten away from sort of very, very expansive development. We've gotten away from these uh, atmospheric deposition of nitrogen. And so we can isolate the role of people on a very small scale. And so that's where we began, our, uh, I beg uh, began uh, a series of work with my colleague at Guam and also uh, an old graduate student from AU actually, who is now faculty at Hong Kong University, who is collaborating on this work. And so this is Guam. And, and uh, if you've been to Florida Keys and other parts of the Caribbean, if you look down on a coral reef, on a nice coral reef, you would expect to find maybe a quarter or maybe one tenth of that bottom covered by coral. And that's sort of the average coral cover on a coral reef in the Caribbean. It's declined. So maybe 30, 40 years ago, it would have been about 25%. On average, it's about 5% now. So, and if you go to the Florida Keys, we're talking about one or 2% coral cover, which is kind of tragic. Uh, this is a coral reef maybe about 50 yards offshore uh, from the marine lab at Guam. And you can see almost all of the bottom is covered with coral. So they have relatively uh, intact and relatively vibrant coral. They do have problems. Uh, their sewage is not treated. And so when you flush a toilet, it just goes right out to shore. Uh, there is some treatment, but not particularly uh, advanced. And so <clears throat> the dominant driver, the dominant source of nitrogen on Guam is sewage. Not deposition, but sewage. People simply flushing their stuff into the ocean. And they simply flush the stuff out maybe half a kilometer offshore. And then the waves bring it back, of course. And so the nitrogen level on, on this island is very, very, very high. And so what we've uh, recently published uh, shows that the impact of disease, that is how bad diseases are, and there are diseases on this island of Guam, uh, is related to how close they are to sources of nitrogen, sources of sewage inputs. And you know where they are. There are pipes that are out there. And, and so coral reefs that are close to high sources of nitrogen get hit harder than coral reefs that are farther away. And so this is about as natural an experiment can be. And um, I was just about two months after we published our study, there was another study who showed the same thing. So I was really glad that we beat them to the punch. <laughs> uh, but uh, this study and the one followed ours was probably the first two to show on a large scale the impact of nitrogen pollution as a driver of coral diseases. And so I, I, I think we got, we got into this uh, question uh, relatively in a timely way. Um, the other thing I want to talk about is the, the role of students in this work. And so for all the times that I've been to Guam, I've always had students join me uh, and doing their thesis work. This is uh, Jamie, who's now working at NOAA, uh, uh, doing some surveys of, of the coral reefs. And one of the great things about Guam is that the reefs are really, really benign. So Florida Keys, you have to take a boat out. And I've taken students out on, on the Florida Keys as well, but when it gets really choppy, you're on the boat, you're, the tanks are clanking around, people are falling over. So, and, and the reefs are about 10 kilometers offshore, so you always have to take a boat, and you have to be at the mercy of the weather. Whether or not, and, and I've been in some really harrowing situations where we've lost our sonar and our radar. There are six foot, seven foot seas, and, and it's, it's, been, uh, it's not as bad as some of the uh, New England uh, work that my colleagues have done, but. It's really benign. This is about seven or eight feet of water, so you can do most of your work on snorkel. You can see the surface of the ocean is pretty glassy clean. And so it's really, really easy. And I feel pretty good about throwing students out there and working with me uh, on some of these projects. Um, 
you don't have to scuba dive, which is a liability uh, uh, issue. And so studying corals, this is uh, Kate Pinkerton, whom I think Peter knows. She was also an undergraduate student. She came through uh, my lab as an undergrad and then continued on to do a graduate work on seagrasses. And so there she is studying seagrasses. It doesn't get any easier than that. Right? <laughs> so what you're seeing here is a uh, quadrat. And so what she's measuring is uh, estimating the cover of the bottom uh, that is comprised of seagrasses. And that is a measure of the health of the seagrass beds. And uh, she uses that to uh, assess the impact of nitrogen pollution again uh, on these uh, ecosystems. Now, this is a shot of Megan Cuddy, who most recently joined me this past summer. Uh, Megan, uh, she's an undergraduate. She's, she was a sophomore when this happened. She was continuing on with the, the seagrass work, but again, you know, we're right, here's land. And so if things get rough, you just walk off and you wait. Now, Megan was really lucky because um, this particular summer trip also uh, took us to Chuuk. Now, Chuuk is an even tinier island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. You go to Guam, uh, which is about, I think, 12 degrees north of the equator. Chuuk is about uh, 8 degrees north of the equator. And it's a tiny, tiny island in amongst a number of different islands that make up this atoll. Now, atolls are uh, prehistoric or sunken volcanoes with peaks that, are uh, that, that break above the surface of the water and corals ring each of these little peaks around them. Uh, as you can imagine, the water is spectacularly clean and um, we're probably in about 60, 70 feet of water and you can see the surface from it. The corals are incredibly luxurious. Um, so this is about two and a half feet of water and you can see where the land is. And if I wanted to get to shore, I'd have to walk over all of these living corals. And again, you can see how calm the water is, how clear the water is. And get, so it's spectacularly beautiful as well as an um, easy place to work. Uh, I was able to get out to Chuk was because, uh, because a colleague of mine um, had this connection. And apparently, I didn't know this, uh, there's a marine lab there. This is run by the Koreans. And so uh, we were invited out to take a look at the coral reefs and sort of infuse ideas, doing research and kinds of things that uh, the, the staff scientists could be thinking about in terms of nitrogen pollution and some of the other techniques that, that my group uh, uses. And finally, you can, should always include pictures of sharks at the beginning of biology. And so this is probably about 70 feet of water. I was on snorkel. Uh, this was after a dive. And so if you can dive just right amongst those things. They're about five or six feet. And they will swim right around you. And then um, they, they sort of hang around in groups. So it's pretty cool. So these are our, our black tip reef sharks. So these are some of the exotic places that I get to do my research. So I want to stop there and open this up to questions and comments. And so the two other things I wanted to, to do with this session is to, to see if there's any opportunities for collaboration. I, can I wheeze myself out to Kenya with you at some point? <laughs> Or would anybody like to come to Guam and study sort of the impacts of the, um, the realignment of the Pacific Ocean? Because right now, Guam is in the, the midst of a move. The Marines from Okinawa are being restationed in Guam. Mm -hmm. And the population on Guam is, is to change by 20% in a span of about four years. And so and that's important to me because that impacts their infrastructure and the ability to treat wastewater, which they really don't, as well as the, the social implications of this relatively massive move. Has there been engineering testing as to what a 20% increase in the population is going to do with this? There is a huge environmental impact assessment, as you could expect. So the Department of Defense carried out uh, a huge EIS. Uh, the, most of the, the environmental impacts, they, they don't really worry so much about. They, mm -hmm. raise, they raise national security issues as a trump card. So they outweigh. Yeah. Right. So there's, there's a huge port there. Um, they've isolated a lot of activities to, to, to different parts, but uh, you know, we're not just talking about the Marines, we're talking about families and the contractors and all of the other services that will be required to support those individuals. Uh, I know that the, uh, in, in the Middle East they've been moving, in, in Iraq and Afghanistan, they've been moving towards solar, uh, a lot of mobile solar power and a lot of LEDs and, and very energy efficiency so right. they don't have to convoy all that uh, fuel around. Is, is that, I mean, the sustainability of the military seems to be a big a big deal in terms of um, for national defense reasons, not having to resupply with 
fuel, is that impacting on, you know, like are there lead, when they build a new um, barracks or something, is it lead sort of by solar power, you know, like the building across the street here or across the way? See, that, that, that's something I wouldn't know, and this would be a great opportunity for somebody who is interested in those sorts of issues to sort of piggyback uh, research opportunities. Uh, in, in terms of their, you know, they have their own power plants. They don't use the ones that everybody else uses for lots of different reasons. But the biggest impact from my perspective is the, literally, the amount of poop that they will put into the coastal waters. Yeah. And that's the big concern. And they are, as far as I know, there is no plan to upgrade the wastewater treatment plants. So about half the people on the island reside on sewer lines. And again, they go through wastewater plants that are either not working or simply filter out the big stuff and pump it offshore. The remaining 50% uh, live on cesspits or uh, injection wells. And because the island is partially carbonate, it's like injecting sewage into a sponge. It simply gets washed out to shore. And so we can, we can measure fairly easily the impact of sewage entering coastal ecosystems. And now that the economy is re rebounding, Tourism is also rebounding as well. Uh, Guam relies on tourism as, as the second most important economic driver. So the military is the most important, and all of the other federal monies that they get. Uh, and also, the second is tourism. And so as Japan rebounds back, uh, more and more Japanese are coming. And interestingly, the Russians are coming. As the number of Russians are getting very, very wealthy, they're moving to different parts of the world, and Guam apparently is now a destination for Russian tourists some very interesting things. Is anybody taking advantage of experimentation with human composting, uh, human waste composting? You know, they, they're not really. Again, a lot of it has to do with uh, who's going to pay for it. When the military isn't... They, they will think about what happens on their bases, uh, but they are not thinking too much about sort of the impacts around the island. I mean, they recognize they will have an impact, but... They're not required. I know they are required, like, if they have an impact, there's an impact fee for military families attending schools in D.C. There's a certain amount of money that goes to D.C. schools to, mm -hmm. and Arlington schools to deal with the impact of their kids. So there must be some... I'm sure there is, on. but I'm sure the money, whatever money gets uh, put into the local coffers, the priorities, uh, the wastewater treatment plant is probably not very high. It's a huge infrastructure investment. I mean, if you think about D.C., and these are some of the local ties, some of the students that I work in D.C. with, the Potomac is, in, in many cases, the same as the situation in Guam. We have a combined sewer system where if it gets really rainy, all the, the sewage simply washes into the Potomac River, untreated, raw sewage. And, and because D.C. was sued by the EPA, uh, we are now paying stormwater fees to create the Blue Plains uh, wastewater treatment, which will take out a lot of the nutrients and also uh, separate out the sewage water from stormwater. Tunnels. Tunnels, yeah, they're, they're resizing the tunnels. And we're just doing that now. And we're doing a kicking and fighting. The same thing in, in the Florida Keys. Uh, even some of the best hotels, if you flush the toilet, and people have done this, they put in viral particles as tracers, uh, inert viral particles. It takes about a day for a toilet flush in the Sheraton to end up on a reef eight kilometers offshore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they fought kicking to put in a tertiary wastewater treatment plant in the Florida Keys, in spite of the fact that they generate like a billion dollars a year for tourism. Um, with the government role uh, changing, as you've described, do you see your ability to conduct research there getting um, more challenging? Easier or not, no change? Yeah, uh, not really. I mean, they, they, they have been pretty cooperative. There are some sites that we need to access that go through a military base. Other than the paperwork, they, they'll let you do that. Uh, the last time we tried, we are about to get on base, but they kicked us out because they were doing a strafing run, a bombing run, and so we have to worry about those sorts of things. But generally, they've been sort of cooperative, at least in that way, in terms of access. Uh, but they're they're not willing to sort of fund these sorts of research projects, and so the funding that I get has to come from, say, NOAA, and more recently from NSF. Mm -hmm. The DOD is not really interested in sort of basic research. And if they do want to do basic research, they fund internally. They get contractors and things like that, where they can control the information. 
I was wondering if um, farmers, I, I don't know what kind of agricultural land they have there, but I know the companies like Syngenta and Monsanto have been using Hawaii for a long time right. to do um, experiments that they don't do on mainland in terms of isolating uh, bio, GMO crops. And there's been a, there's been a revolt in Hawaii. Right. I'm a big island, I think. Yeah, papaya, for example, is one of the first. Um, the other reason why we pick Guam is there's virtually no agriculture there. Which you could mess up pollution because fertilizer is different from sewage in terms of what they, uh, what they do in the environment. 1% uh, of the island of Guam is dedicated to agriculture. So they get everything shipped in, which is bad. Uh, but it's good from our perspective. It just simplifies the ecosystem from our experimental perspective. And so finally, uh, uh, I'm trying to get undergraduates involved in research. Uh, I'm glad Peter is here because uh, the, the dean's office has been very generous in funding undergraduates in the College of Arts and Sciences and getting them out to some of these places. I think the last three or four undergraduates who have come through my lab anyway have had funding from the dean's office and from the provost office. And so I think there's opportunities out there. Uh, I've also had grants to get students out there. But I think having students out there is, is, is also very fun for me and also uh, instructive for them. Uh, the number of the students who have gone through my lab have done these sorts of experiences have also been very competitive for national awards and scholarships and graduate schools. And so I think there are lots of benefits of trying to pull uh, students into your lab both at the graduate and, and the undergraduate level. Um, one student who graduated just maybe a year and a half ago, she was a Fulbright scholar and now she's just coming back from Australia. Uh, I have another student who is applying for another Fulbright. And so I think there are good things that can come from taking these students out. What sort of liability protection do you offer? Uh, again, Guam is great in that respect. I, don't, I worry less about students, um, some scrapes and things and stuff like that, but most things I can bring them back. Uh -huh. um, they have their typical uh, risk management knows that they're going, so they have insurance that way. So they have to, they have to sign waivers and things like that. Um, but I. But the places that I go to, I try to minimize exposure to some of the other dangers that I would, you know, I would expose myself to, but not, not them. And I don't know how it is. It is where you travel. Uh, I mean, you probably have to worry about things like um, uh, malaria and uh, um, internal parasites. Not so much the places I've been so far. Yeah, we do. Uh, we do worry about that. But I think in East Africa, the the main concern I think is proximity to. Uh, to the Middle East. The, I think Al-Qaeda is, uh, is a security risk uh, today. Uh, but I've taken students, I've taken nearly 180 students uh, to Kenya in the last 20 years. And uh, this was usually through uh, my NSF uh, grants, but also I was able to get to research experience for the graduate. Uh, grants that was able to, to get students there. Uh, in talking to uh, to Sarah Dumont, I think she she's been a major supporter of uh, taking students to, to Africa because her argument is that uh, I think most students uh, who go to who go abroad, uh, especially students who go to Europe essentially get harmed or die than have been to, to other places. And I think mean, it has to do with the, the risk factor because the risks are presumably higher in Africa. I think that uh, we take more precaution. Whereas when students are going to Italy or France, we think it's more like here. So in fact, we don't really uh, prepare the students well and therefore they end up in fact are getting murdered or, or killed. Uh, it's been very good, but I think that uh, one has to be always careful, uh, particularly with uh, wherever you take students, uh, whether it's in uh, D.C. or Chicago, uh, the risks are often there. Uh, but certainly I think uh, the outcome, a lot of the students that often uh, have this experiential knowledge often go on, go on to do uh, great things in life, and uh, many of them uh, have their child, their lives changed for, mm -hmm. forever. 
in a lot of ways. Many of us, in fact, got attracted into what we do precisely because of those early childhood experiential knowledge uh, that we get through field work. Uh, so I think uh, it's pretty good. I envy you. <laughs> no, I envy you. <laughs> <laughs> one of the things that uh, one of the programs that we are trying to develop uh, uh, is the a collaboration with colleagues at uh, University of Pune and Deccan uh, in India, where we'll be taking uh, uh, students uh, there for six weeks. Um, India is very stable, but it's also a nation that is on the on the rise, and a nation that I think uh, we need to engage uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, I've been to uh, China and India to find that uh, despite the fact that we are all focused on China, I think that we make an error by sort of leading out South Asia. Uh, because South Asia, especially India, is really on the rise. And it's a world that we, we especially need to, uh, to engage, both for our own competitive edge, uh, but also because there's so much uh, shared history. History, their language, for example, is not really a problem, so students are able to go back and forth. But just the richness of uh, India's uh, culture, from the arts to the sciences, uh, is just is just incredible. And so that's one area that I really want to uh, pay a lot of uh, attention to as we move forward. Any other questions? Thoughts, suggestions? Any exotic places you've been to? None? I've been to Kalpada, <laughs> Jaipur, and I lived in Zimbabwe for two years. Yeah. In South Africa, Malawi, Angola, Gabon. Wow. You should have been up here. <laughs> <laughs> How about Banana. you, Peter? What are some of the exotic places that you've been? Oh, I've just been a tourist. <laughs> I'm a French professor. I, I, I chose my, as I said to you earlier, I chose my uh, nice places to do research thing for a different reason. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the great things about uh, uh, Africa is just how unpredictable it is because no day is ever the same, and I think that uh, uh, it, it's really it's very task taxing for uh, the director because you are always working on the edge because you just don't know what will happen when they come break down or you know a promised uh, a lecturer will not show up or show up three hours later, mm -hmm. but it's it's just this sense of preparedness. Um, and the creativity of, of the people, how people are able to eke a living on so little, uh, but they still have so much hope uh, in what would otherwise be a sea of hopelessness. It's really very intriguing. I found that um, uh, when I take students there, they just marvel at just how privileged uh, they actually are. And I've taken a whole range of students from, you know, very poor backgrounds, inner city kids to uh, extremely wealthy. But all of them come back uh, extremely, extremely uh, changed. And one of the things that I've always done is take at the end of the uh, field school, take these students to visit my mother. Mm -hmm. My mother doesn't speak English. But my mother uh, raised all these kids who are extremely brilliant and, and successful. Mm -hmm. And but she never had to read to us. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think that one of the things that students learn when they see this contrast uh, in terms of just family life and you know, this within rural Africa and they compare to their own, uh, they something changes in their lives. And you can always see this, I think, when the students go to, uh, to Guam and they sort of learn about how 
uh, you have 170,000 people existing almost exclusively on imported food because it, it, nothing grows there. That this is a, a, an economy that is sustained not but by trade and by government. Uh, it really, really changes the way in which they, they sit and look at the whole uh, very idea of the, uh, globalization, inter international trade and governance of this uh, militarization of the world. David Vine would be very good, yeah. I think, in, in collaborating with. Yeah. Uh, we have an email like that for Yeah, I think it will be the, his research. I wonder, you know, because I think he's becoming very well known. So the military might sort of <laughs> uh, refuse you access. But I think, uh, as I was thinking about what you are talking about, realize that uh, this is a great place, particularly with increased militarization in the region. But his research I think, would be benefit much from. Yeah, I mean, one of those things, uh, I, I do think about it, but I also want to make sure that I, I'm isolated enough where I'm identified as a sort of marine scientist, not involved in policy per se, yeah, yeah, yeah. unless I jeopardize my uh, perceived objectivity and possibility exactly. of working with some of these agencies. Exactly, yeah. Shadow collaboration. Shadow collaboration. Shadow, yeah. They're, they're probably listening already. Yeah. <laughs> giving data to him without him being involved. <laughs> Take your drop offs and marry them. <laughs> 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 well, yeah. yeah. Until it gets published, of course, yeah. and then yeah. <laughs> yeah. Professor, I've been um, I'm a graduate student in the Anthro department, um, and I do my research in Ghana in West Africa. And I've been thinking a lot more, I'm in the middle of my foundational your comprehensive examination, dealing with why it's a big theory and, and thinking more about not only the, the, the ways that China and India's increased presence in Africa um, you know, has very practical implications, but also the way it has um, more theoretical um, um, implications than the way that we think about post-colonialism or globalization and, and you know, th these ideas of maybe South-South solidarity, um, but w what is solidarity necessarily and, and is it, you, you, what does it look like when it takes on a more predator, predatory tone um, as some policies you know, oftentimes do? So I personally am also really interested in, in, in looking more at the ways that, that India um, not only is, is rising very quickly in its own right, but also the ways that it's um, increasingly becoming more present um, on the continent. Yeah, that's also good. Well, India's, India's relationship with Africa is, near, is more than 3,000 years. Mm -hmm. It continues, particularly in uh, in Eastern Africa, and I think uh, the the new South South uh, relationship, I think, uh, in most cases, is a response to uh, nearly 500 years of, in fact, uh, the West uh, exploiting the, the or the North essentially exploiting the South, mm -hmm. and I think that uh, because of that. Uh, many African nations are going into entering into these relationships, often blindly. Uh, uh, China has, of all, has obviously won the public relations war uh, because China's argument is uh, the policy is lack of inter interference. Uh, so they look the other way, but they have found a way of, in fact, working with uh, the African elite in ways that I think the West was never able to do that. What they do is they come to a city like Nairobi or Accra and they say, we are going to build roads for you, modernize your cities. Right? So they are able to, in a city like Nairobi, change the time it takes uh, a policy maker to drive from his house mm -hmm. to the office and back home for two hours to 30 minutes. We have been able to do that, um, and so, so while they are making the cities, beautifying the city, and improving the infrastructure, they are also building roads to the resource-rich areas, 
And so in these roads, I think it's now funneling a lot of the resources, whether it's biofuel or minerals, out to the, to the coast and then back to, to China. In fact, in many ways, I think whenever you raise this critique, uh, some of my uh, friends and, and relatives who are now uh, top government officials just won't listen. So in a lot of ways, I think we have lost the sort of looking at history. And I think uh, the other thing is what happened in 1989 when uh, the Cold War ended. Uh, Europe, Western Europe, and U.S. left Africa. They left Africa and they ran off to uh, to Eastern Europe. And that void has now been filled. And now, as we try to come back, we are essentially fair with the friends. So no one is really paying attention. It's very, very tragic. Uh, because in Ghana, where the structural adjustment programs actually work, Ghana was on a trajectory towards, in fact, uh, development. Uh, and I think that that sort of Liberia, nearby Liberia is in shambles. In Zimbabwe, for example, the Chinese are all over the place. Uh, so, but Angola is the same thing. So it's, it's really, really uh, sad. And uh, but, but I think it is what it is. Uh, and I don't really know uh, the way out of, out of I guess Africa will just have to uh, to learn that and, and make the right decision. But the way it is now, I think um, China and India are winning the peer battle in Africa. They are siphoning the resources uh, in ways that I think uh, Europeans and Americans were not able to do in the last 400 years. Why do you think that is? Um, part of it, I think, is uh, has to do with uh, poor governance uh, within Africa itself. Uh, and I think uh, the, the very uh, underdeveloped system of, of governance in a lot of ways uh, an almost absence of accountability in a lot of ways. That is often driven by uh, I don't want to say uh, ethnicity and all of that, but ethnicity is very much a part of it. We look at the conflict in South Sudan. It is not ethnic as it is, but it, it always uh, somehow turns out to be driven by to be driven by that. And I think it has to do mostly with when leaders think says that they are losing, they turn to they play the ethnic card. And I think that they've been able to master masterfully uh, manipulate uh, ethnic loyalty and pride I think to their uh, to the disadvantage of the development of the nation. But you also have uh, very uh, structured class, very elitist uh, system, very much like the European model, where, uh, I mean, in this case, uh, in East Africa, in Kenya, for example, if you have to look at who is who, there are various high schools that people went to. And that's what runs the country. Uh, so that there's this kind of um, social economic ties that have been built over the last 50 years. Uh, mostly like due to the, the system that the, the Europeans left in place have remained intact, have not been, have not yet been dismantled. And so because of that wealth is concentrated into the hands of very, very few people who are not willing to uh, late power ago. Okay, so it's 3.15. Uh, let me thank Chap uh, for
braving the, the flight back and also spending the time to put the slides together and, and forego sleeping for the next few days as you finish <laughs> up some grant proposal reviews. So thank you for that and thank you all for coming uh, this afternoon. So with that.